All right, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you everybody for coming from all these different parts of the world, including from Dharan to Indiana, Indiana and everywhere in between. Um, the title of my presentation is The Birds of Saudi Arabia. Uh, oh, hang on, oh, I went, oh, there we go. The desert is not deserted. Uh, I wanna thank Derek for, and the Learn the Birds crew for, for inviting me to give this presentation. And I wanna thank especially the Saudi Arabian wildlife photographers whose photographs I used throughout, this, throughout the book that uh, Derek uh, showed you and throughout this presentation. So if this presentation is beautiful, it's because of them. And if this presentation is accurate, it's because of those gentlemen uh, that I've worked with over the last eight or nine years here in Saudi Arabia. I live in Saudi Arabia, I work here, I've been here for almost nine years and I've collaborated closely with these people. Um, okay, enough about them, let's talk about me. Uh, I've got a PhD in ecology from the ANU and my specialty is in ornithology. I did my PhD on these magnificent birds, the rainbow bee eater, and uh, I lived on in Rainbow Beach in Queensland, and uh, I, I, I dream about these birds still, 20, 15, 20 years later, I still dream about holding these birds. I study, I'm very interested in social behaviour, and these birds breed cooperatively. They, I, I'm very interested in mate choice, why individuals choose to mate with which individuals and why, and these birds just turned out to be a perfect um, study species. I then lectured for five years at the ANU in animal behavior, conservation, evolution, ecology, and genetics. Um, and during that time, I got to do some side projects on, on birds primarily, um, which is, you know, ever since I was a kid, every single time I see a bird, I feel a little bit happier. So I feel delighted to have spent my working life with birds. Um, so I got to do my research on white-winged chuffs. Again, very social birds. They have social behavior as complex as groups of primates and uh, amazing family groups. My study showed that birds were, they were being deceptive. They were pretending to feed at the nest so that they would get like social credit for um, helping, but they were actually swallowing the food themselves. Um, I studied red-tailed tropic birds. We found that birds with longer red tail streamers pair with ma males with long red tail streamers, pair with females with long red tail streamers, high quality males. Oh, I worked for a while in conserving Gouldy and finches. And I know everybody here has seen hundreds of species of bird in their life and we're all bird lovers. But I can tell you, this is the, the only bird that I've looked at that when I saw it in the field, it literally brought tears to my eyes. It was so beautiful. And there's only a couple of thousand of them left. and they are seed eating birds, they eat grass seeds, and they were starving to death in a landscape full of grasses because the grasses that they need, the annual grasses have been replaced by perennial grasses as a result of fire and grazing. So it was quite extraordinary. I worked on emus, um, uh, not the sharpest tool in the shed, but they are the uh, social, uh, I studied their social vigilance and larger groups were able to detect predators, which was humans, more quickly and responded less with less worry. Okay, I better move it along. Uh, superb fairy wrens. Man, I joined this project. This is an extraordinary study species. I was a part of this project for a short amount of time. The female is the little grey bird and the male is the incredible blue bird. And despite being socially monogamous, this female or these females are the least faithful bird in the world. 96% of all nests includes a male who is looking after young that don't belong to him. So the female would wake up at three o'clock in the morning, fly in a direct line to a male, wake him up, make bird love with him, and then come back to her own partner and he would look after her young, the world's least faithful bird. Okay, then I, I wrote the albatross and giant petrol recovery plan for the Australian government. Um, and I then got a job, a really great job working on Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean, controlling yellow crazy ants. So this island is famous for having 200 million red crabs, um, but we accidentally, humans accidentally introduced a yellow crazy ant. They formed super colonies, which had 2000 ants per uh, square meter, and they killed every single animal that entered their territory and their territories are growing at a meter per day around the perimeter but we eradicated the ants. 
I got to do some research on Abbott's booby while I was there. I was then the science manager for the Save the Tasmanian Devil program. Uh, this is what Tasmanian devils are supposed to look like. But as many of you know, they have developed, well, one female in 96 developed a facial cancer. It was so bad that she starved to death. But before she died, another, male, another devil bit her and some of her cancer cells went into that male and he didn't die. He, not straight away, the, the cancer didn't die. The cancer was contagious. So they have a contagious facial cancer that wiped out more than 90% of the population. Um, and, uh, but fortunately we managed to, uh, this species is not going to go extinct. We've managed to do some really good work there. Okay, so for the last eight years, eight and a half years, I've been living in Saudi Arabia, working with Saudi Aramco, which is a big oil and gas company. And tonight I'm not representing Saudi Aramco. I'm just talking about, this is just Chris Boland, a guy who lives in Saudi Arabia. Um, I've got publications and as Derek mentioned, I've authored these two books. Now, these books, we have, the company is giving away for free to people in the kingdom who, who will value the books. Um, and we're also giving away for free uh, electronic versions. And soon within the next two months, we're going to have a big uh, distribution of these are on, you know, Kindle and iBooks and all that sort of stuff. So everybody in Learn the Birds will have a free copy of these two books. Now for my presentation. Do I have any left time left? I've been talking about myself so much. Um, Saudi Arabia, we, we like to play up how much of a desert it is. You know, it's empty. But there's more to Saudi Arabia than just a big empty desert and camels and oil. And I want to break down some of the perceptions that people might have about what Saudi Arabia is really like, especially, of course, from the perspective of birds. Now, there are, it is a big desert. It's hyper arid. It's one of the driest, hottest places on earth. And nowhere really is moist in Saudi Arabia. There are no rivers and there are no streams. Um, but nonetheless, there are major avifaunal regions that we've mapped throughout the kingdom. So let's take a tour. Let's take a tour from west to east across Saudi Arabia, a 10 minute tour. And um, I'll show you some of the diversity of birds and habitat types that we have here. So when we talk about Saudi Arabia from the, the, the westernmost point, it's actually the Red Sea. So let's go into the Red Sea. We have got some of the most intact and some of the most productive coral reef in the world in Saudi Arabia. It's extraordinary. It's exquisite coral reef. Um, and so above that, there are 1200 islands in the Red Sea that belong to Saudi Arabia. And of course, when you get islands in tropical environments, you get seabirds, lots and lots of seabirds, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of seabirds. So the Sudi Gulf, for example, uh, the Red Sea, uh, most of the world's sooty gull breed and forage in the Red Sea. And we also have usual suspects like brown boobies and, and we have greater flamingos and lesser flamingos coming over from Africa, which is just a hot, you know, skip away. Most of the world's, well, this, the Red Sea islands of Saudi Arabia are the breeding strongholds for this magnificent bird, the sooty falcon. Now these birds are quite extraordinary. They actually breed in autumn and the reason why they breed so late is that they feed their young on the migrants that are returning. So they wait until the, the young juvenile birds that have just been born in Europe and they're making their first migration. You know, these naive birds that most of the time, as you know, migrants, juvenile migrants are flying without their parents. So these young birds making their first migration, are just learning how to fly and this sooty falcon nesting here in Umluj Island in the southwest is uh, just gobbling them up and feeding them to their babies. And we've got really extraordinary birds here. Uh, the crab plover is pretty much endemic to the Red Sea Basin. Um, it, well, most of its breeding is in the Red Sea. And th this bird has no close living relatives. There's no members of its family. It's the only member of its family. Um, they're a shorebird that digs burrows in the ground, it nests in burrows in the ground, and it lays one egg, a huge egg, compared to its body size, and then it doesn't incubate because the warmth from the sand incubates the egg for them. 
Uh, this is a species that is just dying to be studied. You could do a PhD in it and you could study these for the rest of your life. Now that's the Red Sea. When we move further east, we come to the coastal plains of the southwest and then some mountains. So these are the foothills of the Asia Mountains and the coastal plains called the Tehama. This is just near Jazan Dam. And here it's biogeographically, it's Africa. We are biogeographically a part of Africa in the southwest. So we get birds like, and you can see in the name, the Abyssinian roller, the African paradise flycatcher, what a bird. Uh, the African grey hornbill, the Nubian nightjar. So you can really see the African influence down in the southwest. And then we move up gradually up into these prodigious mountains, the Asia Mountains. And there is so many endemic uh, plants and animals in the Asia Mountains. For those who don't know, endemic means animals that are restricted to that particular area. So there are so many plants and animals that are restricted to the uh, Asia Mountains that they're formally listed as one of the world's global endemic biodiversity hotspots. Um, and up there, this is where we get a lot of, uh, again, we get some African type birds, birds of African origin, like the little rock thrush. And look at that photo. I mean, that's a work of art. That is an exquisite photo by a friend of mine, Mohammed al Um, The Abyssinian wide-eye, again, you get this African influence. Violet back starlings, what a bird, man. 40,000 pairs of these migrate across from Africa, across the Red Sea to breed in the mountains of the Southwest and then they return to Africa each year. And this is where we get our endemic species. Most of our endemic species of bird occur up in those Asia mountains. So my father-in-law calls this the Mecca woodpecker, but it's actually the Arabian woodpecker. Um, we got the Arabian waxbill. Now, one of the things about these birds, these endemic birds, is that most of them have not been studied at all. Um, the, the Arabian waxbill, for example, um, a colleague, a friend of mine, Abdullah al Sohbani and um, uh, Ahmed al Omari, we and I, we found the first nest ever of this bird. And for most of the endemic species of Saudi Arabia, there has not been any of their nests ever found or reported in the literature. Um, or for some of them, the maximum of, of six nests have ever been described. So these birds are a gold mine waiting to be studied. There's no baseline data here in Saudi Arabia. Exquisite endemic species, the Arabian sunbird, the Yemen thrush, which sounds like a medical uh, condition that you really want to avoid, but it's actually a, a really uh, special endemic species that occurs only in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. We have our own species of owls that occur here and nowhere else on the planet. Um, Arabian grosbeak, this one as well, the Asia magpie, and I'm actually going to end my presentation on this, but this species is endemic to Saudi Arabia. It only occurs in the Asia mountains of Saudi Arabia and nowhere else on earth. Now, in the north of the Asia mountains, we have the Hejaz mountains, and throughout much of Saudi Arabia, you get these big, we call them jebels in Arabic, these big isolated inselbergs, these big uh, rocky outcrops and of course there are birds that are beautifully adapted to living and nesting and foraging in these boulder fields or in these cliffs so like the little owl and Tristram starling which is again basically endemic to the Arabian Peninsula 99% of its population occurs in Arabia beautiful bird really confiding bird so the central and western region is called the Arabian shield um, it's pretty interesting, you know, a lot of these avifaunal regions, the reason why we can demarcate them is because of geological events that happened millions of years ago. So the Red Sea is, the part, well, the Arabia split apart from Africa several million years ago. When it did, it caused some of the bedrock to be lifted up and, and that lifted up exposed bedrock is the Arabian Shield. Now, over millions of years since, the, the rock has been um, eroded and turned into soil, and that soil has characteristics that make it perfect for acacia trees. So basically, we get acacia trees wherever you get that, that brown region there. So much of that central Arabian shield looks like this, with beautiful, tall acacia trees, and often inside, we call this a wadi, uh, like a dry stream bed, again, full of acacia trees. And where you get those acacia trees, you get some very distinctive assemblage of birds. We get these gorgeous Arabian green bee eaters. And, you know, I love bee eaters, so I love these birds. Um, the Arabian babbler 
if you'll have me back, I want to give a presentation about the behavior of Arabian birds, because behavior is my real passion, animal behavior. And these birds have, I, I, I think it's almost unequivocal that these birds have got the most complex and the most interesting social behavior of any bird ever studied. They've been studied for 40 years uh, outside of Saudi Arabia in Israel, Palestine, and um, they are like groups of chimpanzees. They're extraordinary. And the white speckled bulbul, these are birds that live amongst these acacia, the lappet faced vulture. Uh, well, look at this, this is a juvenile, this is a baby, an extraordinary bird. Um, throughout uh, much of Saudi Arabia, we get these gorges, these, these wadis, and again, as you could imagine, these uh, temporary wetlands that appear after rains and they uh, attract you know, kingfishers and, and wagtails and numerous other birds. Now you'll see um, those blue regions, bluish regions. Um, my friend Bruce made this map for me. He's, he's obviously colorblind. His, his color scheme is appalling. Uh, he's a lovely blue. Um, those bluish purpley regions, they are lava flows in Arabic, it's harats, lava fields. And they're really complex, very, you know, obviously very old flows and multiple flows of lava that sort of intersect with each other. And it creates this jumble of rock that you cannot drive over and you basically cannot walk over. Um, so they are protected areas accidentally, you know, natural protected areas effectively. So the bird life in these is quite extraordinary. And there are lots of birds that are adapted to getting the, um, the food out of those nooks and crannies. Like, for example, the appallingly named sand partridge. I love this photo. It looks like he's got his hands in his pockets or something. But uh, the sand partridge lives on rock, not sand. I don't know why they call it the sand partridge. Um, Cinereus vulture is a bird that you see most often in the Harat, Sarad al Hara in the north. Throughout much of the central region, we get these uh, escarpments. This is Tuaik Escarpment. This place is called the Edge of the World. And um, of course, in these boulder fields, you get striolated buntings and black starts, birds that are ad adapted to living in those desert rock areas, and griffin vultures nesting in those cliffs. Now up in the north, we don't get the acacia there because they haven't, um, it hasn't got the right bedrock. And this is basically a part of it. Well, it is, it's a part of the Palearctic region. And so we get Palearctic species. We get the Eastern Imperial Eagle, uh, Temmings like lots and lots of lark species nesting up there. And as you know, famously occurs in deserts, when it rains, it becomes, the land transforms in the space of a couple of days. And so we get these eruptions of larks where they breed and breed as much as they can. And then they might not breed for years again. We'll talk about that later. And of course we get these vast sand seas, the iconic sand seas, and they really are beautiful and they really are extraordinary. And, and I've, I've spent a lot of time in those. I do a lot, I do, I, I uh, have a, I'm the head of a Arabian Oryx and Arabian gazelle uh, breeding program down in the Rubalkali, the empty quarter. And um, it's, it's like the Rocky Mountains if the Rocky Mountains were on Mars. In fact, that movie Mars with Damien, uh, what's his name, Matt Damon, was filmed just near there. It's an exquisite landscape, mind-blowing landscape. Three, those dunes are 300 metres tall, impossible to photograph. But even there, hyper-arid landscape where it may not rain for a decade or more, we still get birds and we still get birds nesting. The greater hoopoe lark is no better example than that. We also get golden eagles nesting down there because as you know, birds are amazing. You can't keep a good bird down. And we get the critically endangered hubara busted uh, uh, living there. It used to nest there, but I don't think it does anymore. Um, now where I, where I am, that little, the, the black dots are the major cities or the provincial capitals. I'm um, in that little black dot there, Dharam. And this is the East Coast, the Gulf Coast uh, lowlands. We've got mangroves and lagoons. And, and, and uh, as a result, you get these unique assemblage of birds, wide-eared bulbuls, Indian silverbills, common kingfisher, numerous plovers and so on. But we're not done yet. We've still got the, uh, the Gulf. And so Saudi Arabia has got six islands in the Gulf. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, during the breeding season, these are teeming with seabirds and uh, sea turtles important uh, sea turtles. One of the important birds that nests out in the Gulf is the Socotra cormorant. It's another endemic species. Uh, it only breeds in Arabia. Uh, and they form these massive colonies, which all uh, forage simultaneously, colonially. 
and uh, they go out to sea and they hunt uh, for shoaling birds. They work together to plough into these birds. Now, not only do we have these residential species in, in pretty good numbers, as I'll show you in a moment, but we have, look at, the, look at our location in the world. We're close to Africa, we're, you know, from a bird's perspective. We are close to Europe, we are close to Asia and close to the Indian subcontinent. So we're at the crossroads of much of the world. And so as a result, every year, 25 billion, 25 billion birds. I love birds. I know you do too, I just love them. Every now and then you say a fact and then you think about that fact and think, my God, that's incredible. 25 billion birds migrate from the Northern hemisphere to the Southern hemisphere. And then they go around and do it again. Why do they do it? Because they love their kids. They just want to raise their babies in the best possible place. Now, from Saudi Arabia's perspective, we get birds that migrate through the Black Sea flyaway from north to south, uh, such as European honey buzzard, but we also get birds that migrate along the Central Asian flyaway. Now, if you're in India and you want to head north, uh, most birds are unable to pass across the Himalayas. Some can, but some can't, most can't. So they go either east, or if they go west, that often brings them through Saudi Arabia. And then we've got the magnificent East Africa, East Asia flyaway. So that brings, I think, 140 species of bird from Russia, Siberia, even Alaska, even uh, Western Canada. So they come through Saudi Arabia to Africa, such as the Siberian stone chat and the Northern wheat here, which migrates 15,000 kilometers. Um, so the northern wheat, so we got what 292 migratory species recorded in Saudi Arabia. Um, the northern wheat, I wish I had a photo of it, but it's uh, it's a quite an extraordinary migrant, one of the world's great migrants. So it breeds across the northern hemisphere, including that yellow dot there in Western Canada, and then they come back across the world. And as they fly, they stop. For example, they'll stop in Alaska before and they stop and rest and eat for three or four days before crossing the Bering Strait. They'll stop at period, periodically along the way in preparation for hardship that lies ahead. But they stop for 21 days, by far longer than anywhere else on their epic journey at the Caspian Sea, where they forage and feed themselves up because the most difficult part of their journey is about to start. And that is the migration across Iraq, across the Gulf, and then across Saudi Arabia and then the Red Sea until mercifully they get to Africa where there's a bit of food. So the most difficult place for these birds in their migration is of course the Sahara and the uh, Arabian deserts. So as a result of these endemics, as a result of our proximity to these major land masses and these mi three migratory flyways that pass through, we have 501 bird species in Saudi Arabia. Uh, my book says 499, but you know we, we're finding more all the time. Um, there are 220 breeding species, including 19, 20 regional endemics. Probably the number of regional endemics is more like 24 or 25, because there are some. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on some of the subspecies that occur in Saudi Arabia. Fortuitously, we have only 12 exotic feral breeding species in the kingdom. Um, uh, it's very difficult for an exotic species, for an introduced species to take root in a landscape that is as harsh and as difficult, as specialised as this one. So we've got a bit of an advantage there. 281 non-breeding species. Um, note that I said there were 292 migrants, but some of our migrants uh, breed in and so on. So I've been mean, saying 501 bird species. Wow, that's a lot of birds. Um, but then you think, well, you know what? Saudi Arabia is a big country. Um, you would expect by random chance that we should have a lot of bird species, of course. We're one of the 12 largest countries on the planet. So what I've done here, a little simple graph that I've made up, um, I've got the 12 largest countries by area. Um, and then I've divided, the numbers in the bars represent the number of species that each country has. So 501 species in Saudi Arabia, 316 in Algeria, 1236 in China and so on. I've divided the uh, number of birds by the area of the country to come up with an index. In this case, I've represented it, the number of bird species for 10,000 kilometers. And you can see that Saudi Arabia has got more bird types per square kilometer than Canada and Australia, where I'm from, uh, which proudly calls itself the land of birds. 
more than the USA, sorry, Tom, uh, more than Brazil, more species types per square kilometer than Brazil. So the empty, uh, the desert is not empty. The desert is not deserted. I'm not saying we've got the most birds in the world. You know, there's 1,700 in Brazil. There's more than that in Colombia, but we are not empty. We have internationally significant birds here. Now, as I said, there's very, very little baseline data. So that's the reason why I wrote that book with my colleague, Abdal al Sabani, Abu Moran. Um, uh, and it was very difficult because there's very, very little baseline data. So what we did, we got a team of the who's who of Saudi Arabia's um, bird nerds, um, and we mapped the location of each of these species. Now, a lot of this is also based upon brilliant work done by a gentleman called Michael Jennings, who for about 40 years has been creating this the Arabian breeding bird atlas, and he has multiple ornithologists doing bird surveys around the kingdom. He's had 66,000 surveys from around the kingdom and that has helped to create uh, distribution maps of the species. Now we digitized those maps. We turned them into computer GIS layers. And for each species in Saudi Arabia, we mapped their location. And we, as I say, we created this digital layer. Now, I bet you didn't know we had ostrich here, for example. People think, oh, no, you know, what are you talking about ostrich? This is Arabia. There used to be an Arabian ostrich, the same species as the common ostrich of Africa. It occurred throughout the peninsula. It was called the Naim. And there are towns called Nwain. There are rock gravings with, with ostrich on them. We find ostrich feathers. We find ostrich eggs with, with embryos in them. And we know that ostrich occurred here throughout the peninsula until they were hunted to extinction by 1966. So we've been gradually reintroducing them. We are reintroducing the red-necked ostrich, which is from North Africa, which is a critically endangered subspecies. Um, and it's probably the same subspecies or very, very closely related subspecies to the Arabian. And this little population down here is one of the ones that I'm uh, responsible for. And this is where we have the oryx and the gazelle that I mentioned earlier. Now, for each species, the Arabian partridge, this is another endemic. We map their location within Saudi Arabia and we note their population status, whether they're a breeding resident or a winter visitor or a passage migrant or, or uh, they have more complex um, population status like this critically endangered sociable lapwing, which is both a winter visitor and a passage migrant, or the beautiful hoopo, the hood hood in Arabic, which is uh, a breeding resident, passage migrant and a winter visitor. So if we get all of those 501 bird maps that we created and digitally place them on top of each other and ask the computer to make uh, areas where there are lots of birds that occur there, hotter colours, redder, and areas where there are fewer birds, green, then we get this heat map. And this is a first for the kingdom, or first for Arabian Peninsula, actually. And obviously, you get a lot more birds around the coasts, and it doesn't really show up in this image, but there are the highest number of birds occur in the southwest mountains and little patches of the highlands here in the southwest and around uh, Riyadh as well, which is the capital here. Obviously, fewer birds in the great empty quarter, and the photographs I showed you earlier explain why, but nonetheless, there's still 145 bird species can be recorded there because, as I said, birds are amazing. For a bird, that Rubalkali Desert, I'll just fly over it, no problem at all. It's a small part of the journey. Oh, it's a problem, but I can do it. So we get extraordinary numbers of migratory birds. We get pelicans migrating across the uh, Rubalkali. Now we can interrogate those data even further. Um, we uh, assigned, or each bird, we, you know, I assigned it to whether it is an Afrotropical bird. We get three species of roller in, in Saudi Arabia and these demonstrate what I'm stuttering over quite nicely. We get the Abyssinian roller, which is an Afrotropical species. It originated in Africa. Uh, we get the Indian roller, which is a, an Indo-Malay species. That species originated in India in Indo-Malay. And we get the European roller, which is a Palearctic species that originated in the north. Now, if we, and we colored the Afrotropical species red, the Indo-Malay is green and the Palearctic uh, blue. Now, you can see, and logically, we're close to Africa. You get a lot more Afrotropical species in the southwest. You get a lot more Indo-Malay species in the east, and you get a lot more Palearctic species in the north. So we're a melting pot 
basically, of these, as I mentioned, these, this, this confluence of these major land masses all come together in Arabia. So we asked the computer basically to mix those colors. Like essentially we are asking them to mix those three colors together and it blends together like a kid with finger paints. And you can see that if you live in Saudi Arabia, you have the pleasure of traveling from, Afro, from Africa to Indo-Malaysia and up to Europe without ever needing to change your passport or visa or change your currency. So we really are this, and I think that's quite unique. I have never seen an analysis like this. I'm really quite proud of it. And, and so we can show that we are this, this nexus between these major land masses. I think it's pretty cool. We can interrogate those data even further. So we can make heat maps, for instance, of just our endemic species. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it's quite unnerving giving this presentation because I can't see any of you. I don't even know if you can hear me or if you're asleep, but I'm just going to keep on talking. Um, so these are just our endemic species. I said there's 19 of them um, currently recognised. There's probably about 24 in my opinion. But obviously most of them occur here in the those beautiful mountains that I showed you. None, no species is endemic in the, in the River Kali. But basically everywhere there is at least one endemic species. So we have 500 species of bird, 501 species of bird. So we have quite surprisingly high diversity, but unsurprisingly low density. Um, it's not like you walk outside and birds hit you in the face. It's, it's, you've got to go out and work to see them because we're a desert, we're a hyper arid desert. There's very little productivity. There's very little plants in the system. The soil here is the worst soil in the world. One of my colleagues, friends is from Australia, is a uh, professor in um, desert restoration ecology, Professor Kingsley Dixon, and he collected some soil here, did some analysis, said it has the lowest nutrient load he has ever recorded. He's like 700 years old, and he has never seen soil that has such poor uh, soil nutrient load. So productivity here is incredibly slow. Plants that are knee high can be 80 years old. So there is very little productivity, primary productivity in the landscape. Therefore, there are very few birds and very few of everything else. One way that we can represent how few, uh, how low the density is, is this graph, um, which shows the number of annual breeding pairs for each of those 220 breeding species. And you can see that the vast majority of species are just hanging on. There's a few species, the house sparrows, four and a half million pairs and some larks, so there's a couple of million, but most species I represent the data, those same data I represent it differently here. You can see that about a quarter of all of our breeding birds have got less than a hundred breeding pairs in the whole kingdom. And about a half or 45% of all of our birds have got less than a thousand. So there's a rule in, not a rule, a guideline in conservation biology called the 5500 rule, which has recently been upgraded to the 100, 1000 rule. It says, if you've got less than a thousand pairs in your population, you have a very high, statistically, a very good chance of having inbreeding occurring within that population and all of the problems that entails, that, that entails. If you've got less than a thousand breeding pairs, you've got statistically and mathematically a very good chance of suffering from a condition called reduced genetic, oh, you get, it's called genetic drift, where you have reduced genetic diversity just by virtue of the fact that you're being small. So for a quarter or half of our population, we are having these almost inevitable genetic problems. Now, we have interrogated those data further. We've said, uh, me and my friend Bruce Spurwell, uh, we said, um, I asked Bruce, he's the GIS guru, I'm the bird nerd. I said to him, can you show me where those, where the, the decrease, the birds that are decreasing, the populations that are decreasing, where are they in the kingdom and where are the populations that are increasing? Um, and he made this map for me. And I, it's, it's actually, I put this together for this presentation and it blows my mind because you can see that he also made this map for another project that I was doing. These are our heavily, I'll come back to that heat map in a sec. These are our heavily modified landscapes. So the blue dots are artificial wetlands. There are no natural wetlands in Saudi Arabia really. Um, there might be a couple, but these are large artificial wetlands which attract numerous 
wetland birds and a lot of birds are breeding now in the kingdom that didn't used to breed. Now, is that a good thing? Is it a good thing? Like it's exciting for bird twitches, you know? Oh, cool, we've got, you know, the reed warblers nesting here. They haven't been nest recorded nesting here before, but they don't naturally occur here. So is it a good thing that we're interrupting their migration pattern to have them breed here? I don't know. Um, the red burgundy areas are the major urban habitats, which obviously a dramatic impact on landscape. And the vast green areas are these huge pivot irrigations and, and, and agricultural areas, which are flown over them on traveling to Jordan. And, and you see these massive areas in the desert where they're green like wheat fields in the desert. So we have heavily modified a large percentage like every nation on earth has, right? Now, the reason why I show you that is because if we go to this other day, this other map, when we uh, superimpose them, we can see that the areas that are increasing are all the heavily modified landscapes. And the areas that are decreasing are all the natural landscapes. I think this is extraordinarily important. Anywhere where the landscape is more or less natural, our birds are dying. And basically brings tears to my eyes saying that. Anywhere where we humans have modified the landscape, the birds are going up. And that's because we're changing the land. We're changing the natural environment. The birds are going up. We're talking about pigeons and doves and sparrows, birds that we don't really need more of. The birds that are going down, we're talking about hubara bustards and lana falcons and all those beautiful birds that I showed you at the start. So I've plotted these data. I've created this index here. On the left, let me talk you through this graph. On the left, uh, so I've, I've, I've assigned every species of one of those 500 species of bird, I've assigned them to one of six habitat types. Uh, they predominantly occurred in settled urban areas, or they predominantly are found in wetlands or farmlands or coasts or highlands, or that arid scrubby uh, woodlands that I showed you. And then, if, uh, if every species in that, uh, every population in, in the settled areas was increasing, it would score one. If every species in that habitat type was decreasing, it would score negative one. So what you can see is our settled areas, birds are increasing and they've got big population sizes. Our wetland birds are increasing usually. Um, they've got small population sizes, but they're increasing. So that's because these wetlands, we've built them in the last 20, 30, 40 years. They didn't used to occur in Saudi Arabia. We've made them and birds are finding them and they're starting to nest here and their numbers are increasing. Farmlands, we've got big populations of bird, low diversity on farmlands, but high numbers. Conversely, these beautiful, magnificent, iconic desert areas, our birds are dying. Our coasts, which I showed you, have got more bird species than just about anywhere else in the kingdom. Our birds are dying. In the highlands, which do have the highest numbers and diversity of birds, and our endemics are dying. Ah, I hate getting emotional about this stuff. So, Saudi Arabia's avifauna is under stress. Like every country on earth, I'm afraid. Including Australia. We've got the worst mammal extinction rate in the world, so I'm not pointing fingers here. Now, the usual suspects, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, degradation, big problem with overgrazing throughout Saudi Arabia, extraordinary, uh, well beyond carrying capacity of camels, goats, sheep, ludicrous amount of hunting. A friend of mine said it shouldn't be called hunting, it's just killing. They're just killing these birds. Massive numbers of you know, a million birds being killed every year by hunters, by killers. Meso-predator release might uh, need some explanation. Um, meso is Latin for middle, and, and what it means is, and it's a problem around the world, including Australia and numerous other countries, we used to have large predators in the landscape. We used to have lions in Saudi Arabia until 150, 180 years ago. We used to have cheetahs and leopards. There is still an Arabian leopard, the most critically endangered big cat on earth is the Arabian leopard. Um, haven't been seen for 20 years, but they're here. Um, uh, wolves are still here, but numbers are dramatically reduced. So we've lost all of our big bodied predators. What that's done, has it has released 
our middle-sized predators because the big predators used to eat and compete with and terrify the middle-sized predators. So in Saudi Arabia, the meso predator is this beautiful animal, the Arabian red fox. Uh, magn it's the same species of red fox that occurs throughout the Northern Hemisphere, but it's a very distinct subspecies and magnificently adapted to desert life. You can see it's long, thin legs to get its body away from the incredible hot ground. Uh, long tail, extra fur on its feet to, to stop its feet from burning. Long ears to allow evaporative cooling through the ears and the different color and this thin fur. It's a magnificent, beautiful animal, but it's now hyper abundant. Of all of the large mammals in Saudi Arabia, large and middle and small mammals in Saudi Arabia, there are only two that I'm aware of that are increasing. Uh, one is the red fox and the other is the baboon. We have baboons that live in the Southwest. Both of those scavenge from rubbish and there's a big little problem here. Uh, these red fox are wiping out our small ground nesting birds and our small mammals. So this is a major problem. And as you've seen, no doubt in the US, people have been reintroducing wolves into, I think it's Yosemite um, or Yellowstone and, and the dramatic improvement in the landscape that are results as a result of that. Maybe we need to reintroduce lions and leopards here. It's a big task. Okay. We also have secondary poisoning where uh, animals like vultures are being killed because they're eating um, animals like that have been poisoned elsewhere by farmers and, and veterinary uh, medicines, so on. And climate change, usual suspects. Climate change. Now, like everywhere else, Saudi Arabia's climate is changing. Uh, these data are from 2009, unfortunately, but the trend has continued. Temperature is going up significantly and rainfall is going down. Now that's bad anywhere. Uh, it's especially bad when you live in Saudi Arabia and you're a small bird because body temperature for birds, if it exceeds 46 degrees or perhaps 47 degrees is fatal. Birds die when their body temperature exceeds 46 or 47. In Saudi Arabia in summer, the temperature is regularly 45 degrees. I'm talking 120 days in a row, the temperature is 45 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, I've got it written down here. Here it is for my for my father-in-law in, -law in uh, America and those of you who don't speak Celsius, the proper Queen's English, 50 degrees in, uh, it can exceed 50 degrees in the shade in Saudi Arabia. That's 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in direct sunlight, the temperature is 65, which is 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's 80 degrees on sand or rocks. It can exceed 80 degrees Celsius on the ground, which is 176 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can basically measure it in Kelvin. On top of that, we've got these desiccating winds. In Saudi Arabia, it's called shamal, which is the Arabic word for north because these boiling hot winds come over from the north dust storms we get basically if you're a bird there's virtually very little shade in much of the kingdom there is zero surface water naturally and now there is these artificial wetlands but still for the vast majority of Saudi Arabia there is no surface water in places it might not rain for a decade not one drop of rain for a decade in parts of the Rubalkali the empty quarter there are those sandstorms and there is little food or shelter for these birds so it's it's tough right now, it's already hard. If the temp what if the temperature gets hotter? Um, I'm worried about it. And I think this photograph captures beautifully how extraordinary birds are in Saudi Arabia because it shows the challenges. This is a greater hoopoe lark nest, the challenges of nesting in Saudi Arabia. It's unbelievably dry. There's no shelter, very little food, except for little things that live in those cracks. And you might be able to see those uh, wheel prints that fortuitously just missed that nest. So there's you know, human anthropogenic influences in this extraordinary landscape. And yet birds are amazing, right? Nowhere is devoid of birds in Saudi Arabia, even in the middle of that desert, in the middle of these black rock fields where those rocks are over 80 degrees Celsius, we get birds like the greater Hoopoe lark nesting. 
How do they do it? Well, <clears throat> uh, one of the ways that they do it is through extraordinary physiological adaptations. Here we go for time. Not too fast. Um, in small birds, uh, more than half of their water is lost through the skin in a process called cutaneous water loss. Um, the barrier to cutaneous water loss is the skin and the outer layer of the integument of the, of the skin is called the stratum corneum. And this is a layer of flattened dead cells that have been embedded in a matrix of lipids. Um, now in arid larks, in the larks of Saudi Arabia, and this is one of the really good studies that's been done within the kingdom, the stratum corneum contains a really unusual combination of cholesterol and fatty acids and other substances that bind together to dramatically reduce water loss. Now what's interesting is that combination of, of acids and cholesterol and so on, if it occurs in mammals, including humans, uh, through some strange mutation or, or issue, then that mammal suffers a debilitating, life-altering condition called Gulch's disease. How birds in Arabia avoid Gulch's disease is a mystery to science at the moment. Uh, now, wonderfully, desert larks, I'm not talking about the species desert lark, I'm talking about ar arid larks, uh, in Saudi Arabia lose 50% less water than temperate larks of the same body size living in Europe, despite the fact that Europe is significantly cooler and wetter. Desert lark, arid, arid larks in Saudi Arabia lose half as much water as those temperate larks. So they are wonderfully adapted to these extreme challenges of living in the desert. There was a study where there were 20 larks of, uh, of similar body size that had their cutaneous water loss measured. And the five larks with the lowest are all the larks that they measured from Saudi Arabia. The Arabian lark, previously known as the Duns lark. There are Duns lark in Africa. The Arabian Duns lark has been separated into a new species. Black crowned sparrow lark, crested lark, desert lark, and greater hooper lark. So our larks have got these physiological, our birds have got these physiological adaptations to living in the desert, not surprisingly. They also have much lower basal metabolic rates. So their BMR is 43% lower um, then, um, again, similar sized larks from temperate environments. Just by virtue of having a lower BMR, they, their water loss is reduced by a further 27%. And importantly, their body temperature is reduced by over a degree compared to other larks. So when you are in a climate that is approaching that lethal limit every single day and can exceed it, um, Reducing your body temperature by 1.1 degree will save your life. Uh, extraordinarily, well, that is quite mind-blowing, the, the basal metabolic rate lowers during the course of the summer. So as the temperature increases throughout summer, its BMR, BMR gradually lowers and the cutaneous water loss gradually reduces. The, the stratum corneum gradually changes. The animal, every summer, it, its body changes to, to overcome the increasing uh, intensity of the heat and the aridity. And the digestive organs shrink by 30% and other organs shrink by 25 to 30% during the course of the summer. And this is very reminiscent of uh, migratory birds that undertake these epic migrations and their, their digestive organs and their muscles and basically every organ, even parts of their brain, reduce in, in size as the animal catabolizes, digests its own internal organs. By the time a migratory bird gets to its breeding ground, it is basically, it's, I hope I'm not being a crass Australian here, but it's basically gonads with wings, like everything else has been dissolved and, and, and digested so that the animal can get there, except for its gonads because it's going there to breed. And then it regrows those organs when it gets there. The same thing happens in the desert. In these desert birds, the digestive organs shrink. It, it catabolizes it. It, it. it digests its own organs. And then it regrows it. Now, I always think it's extraordinary to think of an animal growing and shrinking an organ, shrinking an organ and then growing it. But our brains are a little bit malleable, more than we realize. For example, London taxi drivers they, the part of the brain that is, is responsible for spatial memory is called the hippocampus. 
London taxi drivers who have been in the service for 20 years, their hippocampus is 40% larger than the average Joe Blow like me, because that part of the brain has grown uh, in the course of 20 years. And you think, well, 20 years, that's a long time. Think about, I learned this when my wife had two kids. Human women grow an organ when they get pregnant. They grow a placenta, that's a new organ. And then they eliminate the placenta and then they grow it again. If you have eight babies, you grow an organ eight times. So it is remarkable, uh, but nonetheless, I, I, I find it extraordinary that these animals digest their organs uh, during the course of the summer and then regrow them. <laughs> so they also have these behavioral adaptations, no doubt. So this is a desert life, just finding this little drop of water. And just, I hope you're, I hope you're appreciating the wonderful photos taken by my Saudi friends here, men and women like Buha. Um, who, who, who are taking these magnificent photos. Okay, I'm sort of running out of time here, so I'm just gonna press on. Because it's so hot, most foraging during the breeding season occurs before 9 a.m., before 8 a.m. and after 5 p.m. Um, it's just simply lethal for small birds, and most large birds to be out in the sun. So what do they do? They, they find these plants like citrullus or corcoris, desert gourds, which have got these incredibly deep tap roots, 20, 30, 40 meter long deep roots that go down into the ground layer, groundwater, and they suck up water. And, and so that water is evaporating through the stomata, through the pores in the leaves. And so just for a few centimeters above those plants, the temperature can be 15 degrees cooler than the surrounding air and significantly more humid. So you'll see them exposing their brachial vein and their highly vascularized uh, wings and, and, and legs and, and, and letting evaporative cooling just for a few moments to cool them down. This study was done in Kuwait. They showed that when the air temperature was 54 degrees, 130 Fahrenheit, the surface of the ground was 70 degrees Celsius, the plant was 41. So it's still bloody hot, but uh, excuse the French, uh, but uh, you know it's hot when 41 is considered as respite. Not only that, they exploit plants, they also exploit animals. This is the dub lizard in Arabic, the spiny tailed. Um, you can see it emerging from a burrow. Um, their burrows are huge, you can see it from space basically. Um, and this study was done 20 years ago, or what's that? Yeah, 22 years ago. But you can see in this study, the temperature of the air was um, 40, 45 degrees during the middle of the day. The temperature of the ground around it was 64 degrees. <laughs> it's hot here. Um, but the temperature inside the dub burrow is 41 maximum. So again, you know, you know you're in a hot place when that's regarded as respite. The temperature of the sand inside the burrow basically stayed the same temperature, 35, 36. So those larks, many of those larks share, they, they go in and they live during the daytime inside those burrows of the dub. Now, <laughs> that's good news, you know, except the dub is decreasing rapidly. It's vulnerable internationally. It's endangered within Saudi Arabia and it's hunted unsustainably. I'm gonna show you a terrible photograph. So this photograph was posted on social media. I was thinking about blanking this guy's face out, but I thought, nah, stuff it. He put it on social media. This isn't hunting, this is just killing and it's unsustainable and it's not representative of Saudi Arabia. Most Saudi Arabians don't do that. Most Saudi Arabians love their dub and their spiny tailed lizard. But events like that cause dramatic declines in these long lived animals and that's causing dramatic declines in our birds. Um, there's reduced productivity um, because as I said, there's very little food in the landscape. So the chicks have to have a vastly reduced basal met metabolic rate. Now, I just realized I'm, I've got another 10 or 12 minutes to go. I hope you don't mind, I'm going over time. I could talk about the birds of Saudi Arabia till midnight if you allow me, but please give me 14 more minutes. I hope go for okay. it, Chris, go for it. Thank you, thank you. So I'll slow down a little bit. Now, um, there's very little food. So the chicks, they have to grow slowly. Now they leave the nest at 10 days which is actually, you know, sounds quite quick, but most larks leave the nest at seven or eight days, which is actually the fastest rate of growth physiologically possible for a bird. But our larks grow about 30% slower, which exposes them to, because they're nesting on the ground most of the time, which exposes them to predation for 30% longer. 
They grow slower because their parents feed them so little. They have much reduced metabolic rate. And because of that, they require 30% less food than a normal lark, 50% less water. But the parents are lucky if they can squeeze out two young, sometimes three, most of the time, one or two young per clutch. Now, when an animal has got a very low uh, reproductive rate like that, that means that it is very vulnerable to population declines. If an animal population declines in number, it takes, it's, it's very difficult for it to recover. Not like rabbits, which famously can have heaps of babies and 10% you know, of the population is lost. We can recover that in a year. But if you're a lark, a desert lark, and an arid species of lark, and you only lay one or two young, it takes decades to recover from a 10% loss. And many years, they just simply do not breed at all because there is no rain and no food. And for a short-lived bird, if you uh, forego breeding for one or two years, that has a big impact, a massive impact on your lifetime reproductive success. Now, ah, the Arabian red fox rears its beautiful head once again. What a photo. This was taken where I live, actually, Dharan. It's a great nest predator. It's a beautiful animal. It's a very effective nest predator, and so are wild dogs and cats. And they cause extreme, nest, next, extreme rates of nest predation on our larks. This study was done actually outside in Turkmenistan, outside of Arabia, but our, uh, the same thing occurs throughout its range, I'm sure. There is so much, the females do most of the nesting in the uh, larks usually, and they do most of the incubation, or all of the incubation and most of the feeding and brooding of the chicks. Uh, as a result, they are far more likely to suffer from predation at the nest than the male. So by the end of the breeding season, there are four times as many males as there are females in crested larks because the females have been killed as a result of these extreme rates of predation by foxes and so on. So as a result, you have to predict that the females are laying uh, more female young than males to maintain parity in the population. Theory suggests that high quality females will lay female daughters, poor quality females will lay sons. Now, that's larks. I'll very quickly, I'll tell you about a couple of other examples before I finish on my main point. It's not just larks that have these behavioral adaptations. We've got white cheek terns. A lot of our terns and seabirds, they nest during the peak of summer in the Red Sea and the Gulf because the peak of summer is when those two bodies of water have the most fish productivity. These birds want their babies to get the most amount of food because we love our kids and they love their kids. So they nest in the middle of summer on islands that have no trees. So they are baking in the Saudi June and July summer. So what do they do? Their, their, their eggs and their bodies and themselves are getting boiling hot to the point that they are approaching that lethal temperature. They swim into the water, they fly over the water, they dip their bellies in the water, they rest in their bellies in the water, they fly back to their nest and their bodies are soaking wet and they cool themselves down, but more importantly, or as importantly, they cool their eggs and their chicks. Uh, a friend of mine, Abdullah uh, al Sulabani, Abu Umran, did this neat little study several years ago for his masters. Um, there's a white cheek turns, temperature is 45 degrees. Um, the temperature of the egg, is 38 degrees when the adult is sitting there with a warm, dry belly. So the temperature of the egg is, is rising and rising. It gets to 38 and the adult thinks, oh my God, my, my eggs are gonna die. Um, so she quickly, he or she quickly goes for 30 seconds, goes and dips her belly. And in that 30 second period, temperature goes up to 40 degrees. So it is imperative that these birds are not disturbed when they're on the nest or else their chicks will die. They quickly race back to the nest and the egg temperature cools by two degrees to 36. They do this all day. They just go and dip their bodies in the water and keep their eggs cool. So they are another example like the larks living right on the edge of what is possible for birds to survive in the heat. The lapid faced vulture is perhaps, I think, you know, we all know the example of the, in Antarctica, the emperor penguins that, that survive in the coldest, hardest place on earth. Well, flip it around. What animal, what bird do you think survives through the hottest place on earth? I'd say my contention is that it's a lapid faced vulture, which occurs in Africa and Central Arabia. This bird nests, it's, it's such a big bird and its nesting phase is so long, it takes 12 months to raise one chick. They start courtship and nesting in October, and then they lay their eggs and they're incubating in throughout the winter. 
Some of their eggs are incubating in April, which is now, and it's getting pretty damn hot. And they're rearing chicks until August, some of them. Right? So these adults are sitting on the nest and their chicks are sitting on the nest on the tops of trees with not a skerrick of shade through April, May, June, July, August, sitting there in the baking sun. They lower their heads because their heads have got no uh, hair or uh, feathers on them, um, much like myself, and um, they keep their bodies over their young and their egg to keep the sun off them. When the chick hatches and becomes mobile, the adult leaves its wing open like a parasol to keep the bird shaded. But it can only do that until the, you know, the lactic acid builds up and it drops its wing and it keeps its arm up for 20 seconds and then it drops it again. It does that for hours on end until its partner comes and replaces them for months on end, in the hottest place on earth, in the hottest time in history. What will happen if the temperature gets even hotter? What will happen to the birds of Saudi Arabia when the climate becomes even hotter and even drier? They're already living on the maximum physiological and, 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 and behavioral limits of aridity and heat. What is gonna to happen to the birds of our beautiful, bizarre kingdom when the climate becomes hotter and drier? And we've seen the, the scientific literature is replete with examples of studies where we are seeing birds distributions moving north in the northern hemisphere or south in the southern hemisphere to escape the heat. And birds from that are adapted to more warmer environments are moving into these climates that are changing. But in Saudi Arabia and in northern Africa, where are these birds? Got, where, there are no birds to move in here. There are no birds that are adapted to hotter in conditions because there are no hotter conditions on Earth. So I'm worried that we are going to lose birds from North Africa and Saudi Arabia. Now, there is some hope. This is a hope from a humble house sparrow. The house sparrow occurs naturally in Saudi Arabia. It used to occur here in very low numbers, but is a natural species here. But of course, it's famous for living in, in urbanized areas. And you can see that it's rapidly colonized Saudi Arabia in the last 40 or 50 years. And even in that relatively short amount of time, 50 years, um, it has got significant adaptations to living in hot, dry environments. Its stratum corneum is significantly modified. It has 25% lower cutaneous water loss than the same species of bird living in Europe or the US or Australia. Its basal metabolic rate is significantly reduced. So it is adapting. Uh, to Saudi Arabian conditions, but can birds, that's 50 years, can birds adapt quickly enough? I don't know. Now the Saudi Arabian, uh, the house sparrow is a common and ordinary bird, but it's also uncommon and extraordinary. There are very few birds on earth that are as successful as this bird and as adaptive and as malleable and, and, and as plastic as this bird is. So this I think is an exception. I think a better example, Sadly, is this one, and this is my final, um, my final uh, story. The beautiful Asia magpie. This is the front cover of my Birds of Saudi Arabia book because it's the only bird that's endemic to Saudi Arabia. Um, we've got 20, 19, 20 species that are endemic to the peninsula. This is the only one that occurs only in Saudi Arabia. Now, I've got five minutes to go, folks. We used to think, I mean, this bird was first discovered by Western scientists in 1936. And they said, oh, yeah, that's, that's, I've seen that bird. That's the uh, magpie that we've got throughout Eurasia. And people just said, okay, that's fair enough. But look at its distribution. This is the Eurasian magpie that it is closely, you know, it's reasonably close related to. It occurs throughout 58 million square kilometres. And then there's this funky little population down here in the southwest. And people, until three years ago, said, yeah, yeah, it's all one species. They kind of look the same. And, um, of course it's a different species. <laughs> of course it's a different species. It's the most isolated population of magpies on the planet. Uh, and uh, it is morphologically different, it's larger, it's got different bill shape, it's got different coloration, it's got different vocalizations, and more importantly, it's genetically different. It's reproductively isolated. This is a unique species, separated from Eurasian magpie 4.3 million years ago. And it's been living in isolation in the Southwest in those mountains, the coolest, wettest part of Saudi Arabia for 4 million years. And I don't think it's gonna be living there much longer because this population is 
plummeting to extinction. <clears throat> I get, again, I get emotional, God damn it. Now the Asia Magpie range, we used to think it was 58 million square kilometers, but it's not. This is what you'll see in, um, oh, you see in Red List or the Handbook of the Birds of the Worlds and so on. But this is an overestimate of its population range, its distribution, because it only occurs above 2,200 metres. It used to occur from Taif in the north to down uh, Zoran al Janoub in the south, near the border with Yemen. Um, uh, but even that is an overestimate because in the last 10 years, it's only been recorded between Andamas and Belasma and perhaps a little population just north of Abha. But even that is an overestimate, as I'll show you why. <clears throat> um, it only occurs about, now it's never been studied, like all of our birds, it's never been studied. There's no baseline data, but we mined uh, existing anecdotal reports, published reports. When you live in countries like this, you have to take what you can get. And I was able to find in the literature reports that it's only ever been found above 2,200 meters, once below that. It prefers to nest in forest, and forage in forest. It prefers to usually see it around drainage channels like wadis, we call them in Arabia. It avoids nesting near humans. You will see it foraging near humans, but it very rarely nests in human habitat as far as we're aware. And it, you, know, you don't see it on steep slopes. Now we can use our magnificent GIS computer machine to, I said to my friend Bruce, show me in Saudi Arabia areas above 2200 meters. Now show me areas, and this is all the computerized printout here, that are close to forest. Areas that are closer to forest are shown in green. Areas that are further away are shown in red. Show me areas that are close to drainage channels and areas that are away from human settlement and areas that are away from steep slopes. Now combine them all together. And what we see is that between Taif and Zaran al Janoub, there's only 80 square kilometers of what we regard as prime habitat left for this species. And that's not the end of it. Those 80 square kilometers are fragmented into 14 very isolated fragments. And it's worse than that because they only occur in 14 square kilometers of prime habitat. <laughs> And uh, they've disappeared from all the other remaining prime patches. <clears throat> Sorry, I get emotional about this sort of stuff. <clears throat> I, I used to live on Christmas Island. I was the last person to see the Pipistrel, Christmas Island Pipistrel bat alive. It's a stink now. It still gets me. So <clears throat> that's not the worst of it. <laughs> Optimistically, we think there are 100 pairs left. And in 2020, there was a wildfire through their prime habitat. <clears throat> So we are looking at an extinction event in real time. Magpies are poor dispersers. They've never been studied the Asia magpie, but Eurasian magpies and North American magpies are poor dispersers. Eurasian magpies on average, their young nest 400 meters away from their adults. Now our fragments are kilometers away, 20 kilometers apart from each other. They are not able to disperse from one little patch to the other. So each fragment is likely to be containing uh, inbred, and genetically to corporate populations. And if you've got individuals separated on the, I think these individual populations are separated on the very tops of mountains. Uh, and, and as climate gets hotter, their habitat is going up and up and up the mountains until they are separated on these islands of mountains. They're unable to disperse between each one and each population is vulnerable to these genetic uh, impacts. And it's other things. If you've got 20 birds in a population, there might be 10 males and 10 females. Now, statistically, they might have 10 male and 10 female daughters, but they might have 15 males and five daughters that year, like when you toss a coin. And so your effective female population is only five females and then one female, and then the population is gone. So we, this publication came out last year. So, as I said, these birds may be more representative of the problems that are going to face Saudi Arabia and North Africa and other uh, extreme desert countries. So I'll conclude my presentation. I'm normally a very optimistic sort of human being, but 
I'll say the birds of Saudi Arabia, I hope you realize that this kingdom does have internationally significant bird fauna. The desert is not deserted. And I hope that in 50 years time, we can still say that the desert is not deserted. Thank you very much. And I hope that you enjoyed that. Thank you, Chris. That was an awesome presentation. Uh, I, I'm blown away. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm blown away by both the positive aspects and the negative aspects. Um, let's hope that the positive outweighs the negative because it does look like an amazing place. And uh, yeah, it, is, I, it, it makes me right. want to see more as well. Yeah. You know? It is an amazing place. And I don't want to sound like I'm picking on Saudi Arabia because I feel like you could, I could say the same about Australia and America and every single country on the earth, we are facing a biodiversity crisis that we're all kind of aware of. So it is an amazing yeah. place. And I wanted the first 10 or 15 minutes to be a showcase of the beautiful things of Saudi Arabia's wildlife. And, and once this coronavirus goes away, uh, Saudi Arabia has introduced uh, tourist visas. It's easy for people to come to Saudi Arabia and visit, and I strongly recommend it. Okay, so I'm just going through the chat to see if people have some questions. Um, <clears throat> lots of people making uh, very positive uh, comments. And uh, when you mentioned that you want to come back and talk about behavior, I said yes. And, and, uh, <laughs> I'd love and, to. and especially, um, you know, the, the, the babblers are a really interesting group. So behavior is my, um, that's my specialty. This the stuff that I was talking about physiology that I'm, I'm out of my wheelhouse there. So I'd love to come back and talk about Arabian bird behavior. So we'll make it happen. Hear that, people. We'll make it happen. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, um, someone's asking, are the artificial wetlands conservation efforts or byproducts of some other human activity? Uh, the artificial wetlands, um, primarily um, the treated wastewater. So most of them are around large cities. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we extract it's quite extraordinary. We extract this fossil groundwater, um, you know, which can be thousands of years old, and then we drink it and flush it down the toilet, and then that goes out to these sewage treatment works, and, and they become these these inland wetlands. And also, there's industry such as the oil and gas industry, which produces a lot of treated water, um, and so they create these evaporative ponds, and uh, they attract a lot of birds. So most of the time, it is through human activity. Uh, some of them have been modified to, to enhance their biodiversity value. So um, they've got reeds and, and uh, shorelines placed around them. So they are co-opted to be conservation efforts. And then there's another related question, I guess. Are there any natural, any national parks or nature reserves in Saudi Arabia? There are, good question. I didn't mention that. And somebody else mentioned, I'm going so fast, they don't, they don't get a chance to look at the presentation. I, I'm sorry, I, uh, I have a tendency to put a lot in. Um, there are national parks. I think that there are about 15, 18 national parks in Saudi Arabia. Um, some of those are very large. There's one called Uruk Bani Marid down in, this, in the western, southwestern of the uh, King, south western part of the Rubalkali Desert, which is enormous. There's a beautiful place called Mahazat Asayid, which is a um, fenced area. It's the largest fenced area outside of Africa. And inside that has got extraordinary landscape. And, and, and you can see in this fenced area, you can see within Saudi Arabia, any time you get a fenced area, um, you see the vegetation, which should be throughout Saudi Arabia because there are no camels grazing on there and there is no off-road driving and there is no hunting and clearing for firewood. So there are numerous natural reserves and the, uh, the government has recently announced some very large new royal national parks. That's good news. I mean, I, I uh, personally in South Africa, I, I, I think the thing that keeps me in South Africa is the fact that there are all these national parks. Um, <clears throat> you know, I wish there were more, and the kingdom has made uh, some big statements in the last couple of weeks and in the last couple of years. They have made this really big realization that um, that Saudi Arabia has got some really extraordinary landscapes and some really extraordinary rock art. Some of the world's best rock art in Saudi Arabia, 
as well. So it's it's an extraordinary kingdom, and I hope you can come here. I also want to say, sorry, Derek, I'm, I'm, I have, I'm, I've got the motor mouth today. Uh, I want to say, um, I noticed there's some friends from Saudi Arabia here. So assalamu alaikum and uh, Ramadan Karim to my Saudi and Muslim friends all around the world. Uh, so then there's another question. This tradition of hunting of wildlife, is there any popular sentiment growing against it? That's a very good question. Um, I think the answer is no. I mean, yes and no. There's, there, is a, there is a big tradition of hunting wildlife here um, and it's, it's increasing and the use of high powered rifles and you know, they're the misnetting birds and just killing birds in misnets to eat and, and, and uh, people, people sometimes post some of these quite graphic images on social media proudly and then the uh, response is overwhelmingly negative against them. So that dude that posted the picture of him celebrating on top of those 400 dead lizards, um, if you read the, the responses that they got on their social media, they got lambasted and rightly so, and they got put in prison. Um, so 19 out of 20 of the comments will be negative. So yeah, there is, I think there is a growing sentiment against it, but I don't think there's much awareness of it. So that's why there's a yes and no. There's not a great deal of awareness generally about the level of hunting and the implications and the impacts it's having. I grew up in a hunting culture and, and changing a hunting culture to something else is a long project. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I agree. And I mean, I didn't grow up in a hunting culture and I never understand why people hunt, but some of my friends do. Um, I just don't get it personally. But um, it is a difficult thing to change that culture. I, I worked in Vietnam for a little while on some animals called snub-nosed monkeys. And, and when I was there, they said, we don't have a word for conservation in our language. And, and, and I see that here when we're, we're translating the Birds of Saudi Arabia book into Arabic. And there are terms that don't have an Arabic word because there's just not necessarily this culture of, of biodiversity study. And, and so, yeah, changing that culture is long and hard, but extremely important. Mm. Well, I mean, the good news is, okay, I'm, I'm not exactly a young guy, but in my lifetime, it's changed. Uh, so there is hope. Yeah, 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 <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, really positive comments, Chris. I think if we could stand up and give you a, a standing ovation, I think we would. <laughs> yeah. uh, I can I can answer more questions, or are you worried about time? I'm no, I'm just looking at the more questions. I'm just scrolling down. Um, well, what one... is the government support of um, yeah. conservation and attempting to reverse some of these alarming trends? Yeah, really. Here's some good news. Um, the, the, the Saudi Arabian government has, has said, we need to do something about this. They've created a new uh, authority for the protection of Saudi Arabian wildlife, which is uh, coming online now, the National Center for Wildlife Conservation. Um, they have an enormous budget compared to what has been the case for the last 20 years. The Saudi Arabian government has just announced in the last week or two that they want to plant 50 billion trees in the kingdom and in the peninsula and around the world. So they're aware that Saudi Arabia has a significant impact on emissions and climate change and so forth, and they're in carbon. And so they are making significant steps to change that. And so it's, it's, it's an exciting time for biodiversity protection in Saudi Arabia. They are um, creating these vast new wildlife national parks in the royal national parks in the kingdom so five years ago it wasn't looking so good in five years time i hope we can say man this has been a real turnaround and let's see ibrahim is asking what's your favorite bird in saudi arabia impossible question ibrahim uh i have a very soft spot for the arabian green bee eater because i I love bee eaters. I, I have a very big soft spot for the Asia magpie because you know, it's, it's very important to me. I wrote 
I wrote a recovery plan for the ASEAN Magpies a couple of months ago, and this actually answers that last question. I, I realized that I, I guess I know more about the ASEAN Magpie than, than anybody else. So I, I said, I'm, I'm not gonna sit back. I wrote the recovery plan and sent it to the Saudi government. And they rang up and said, we're enacting it. We, we, we've, got, we've, got, we've got $20 million, we're gonna save it. Um, so I have a big soft spot for the ASEAN Magpie. Um, I like, I like all birds, <laughs> I don't know, I love birds. <laughs> i tell you what, I, I, I got to hold the Arabian woodpecker. That was pretty cool. And, um, and, uh, and I also love the uh, violet-backed sunbird, that's the violet-backed star starling. Now, the violet-backed starling is pretty cool, but I, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, you were passionate about birds and I think that's, yeah, I that does it all. Um, and there's a question about the oryx and gazelle, um, not bird related. Is the work that you are doing in the Southeast with Arabian oryx and gazelle being done through your role with Aramco or is it a separate thing or? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, Aramco has undertaken this initiative. Again, I'm, 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 I'm not wearing my Aramco hat today because, because if, I, if, if I was representing Aramco, I would need to get approvals and so on. But I, I think it's reasonable to say, everything I say is uh, in the public domain anyway. The Arabian oryx and the gazelle and the ostrich uh, is the focus of a huge uh, conservation effort by Saudi Aramco in the Rubalkali in the southeast. We built a, uh, a wildlife sanctuary that's 637 square kilometres, um, which is the same size as Bahrain. If it was a country, there are 18 countries smaller than it. And we reintroduced oryx and gazelle and ostrich because those animals used to occur there and they were hunted to extinction and uh, in the region. And so we've reintroduced them. And uh, now we've got about 120 oryx and uh, 110 gazelle and the ostrich aren't doing so well. We've got about five ostrich. Um, they're, they're struggling, but we're not giving up on them yet. And um, so, yeah, it's a work, it's a work thing that I'm very, very, very glad to, uh, to be a part of it. Elizabeth, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip your question, but uh, I don't think that's a fair thing to put someone on the spot with, but uh, it's a political question, which is out can, of place. I can, answer, I can answer. Do you have any fears in terms of criticizing for the radio? <laughs> I, I mean, I, every time I move this chair, it sounds like I'm farting. I just want you to know I'm not farting. If you can hear this weird noise, it's, it's the chair, I swear. Um, and I said that just to give me time to think. Um, I don't feel any need to criticize the political regime. Um, I mean, I come from Australia where we have the, the worst mammal extinction rate in the world. There's no country on earth that's not struggling with these things. Um, I just, everybody does what they can and, and we, can they do more? Yeah, of course they can do more. Can Australia do more? Yeah, of course we could do more. Can America do more? Yes, we all need to do more. Um, but I, I don't feel the need to criticise. I'm just trying to help. Um, are there any attempts to create new corridors you know, for the ASEAN magpies and so on? Uh, loosely. Um, the problem, you know, as I say, there's, there's numerous tree planting initiatives that are being embarked upon in Saudi Arabia, and I want them to plant juniper trees in the ASEAN, in the ASEAN ranges. The challenge is one of the reasons why the, SEA, the, the juniper forests, for example, are declining is because of poverty and hunger and people chop them down for firewood and so on. So we need to plant those corridors, but we also need to educate and create sustainable, uh, alternative sustainable livelihoods for these, for these people. And, and the next question actually is, is kind of is logical to follow on from that. Do you, do you know that if do you know if after COVID the kingdom will, or, will organize any sort of bird watching tours or other bio tourism efforts? I mean, I would imagine there are some tour guides and things that would lead people. Well, to you know, there's, there's like there's basically no tour guides in Saudi Arabia at the moment. Oh, it's really? It's just started like a, about five minutes before coronavirus came, and then and so there's basically uh, there's basically no tourism, but uh, eco tourism. But there's um, there's a gentleman I know, well, there might be some, but I don't know of them. The one gentleman I know is a guy called Rob Sheldon. He's the chair of the Ornithological Society for the Middle East, and he takes tours to the ASEA, and he's planning on taking a tour, I think, in May this year. And um, so if you want to go, you can get in touch with him. Um, they, they, I believe that there are plans from the kingdom 
to create more ecotourism. There's a big uh, um, push to create um, a, a Royal National Park up in the north west called Neom and there will be ecotourism up there and uh, I'm sure that there is plans to make ecotourism a big part of the southwest. In the southwest the mountains of Saudi Arabia, I wish we lived over there to be honest because it's my favorite part of the, of the kingdom because it's the whole landscape is, is should be natural and cultural heritage listed under UNESCO World Heritage because it's magnificent. So if you do come to the kingdom I strongly recommend the southwest. Are there any laws that limit hunting? There are so many laws in Saudi Arabia that limit hunting and so on. The issue is enforcement. And this is a problem in a lot of, uh, a lot of nations. Um, uh, and again, in the last couple of months, the kingdom has announced a new environmental enforcement agency. And my dear friend, uh, Abdallah Suhabani, is, um, is, is moving into that um, to be the head of that and uh, so there are laws there are limits there are quotas there is not enough enforcement but that's changing are there women birders in Saudi Arabia there are a few I believe that one of them is listening today a lovely young lady that I met called Manira there's a several of the photographs I presented was from a woman called Duha Al Hashimi uh, in the Jeddah and um, she, I, I call her Um Warbler because she is the queen of warblers. Um means the mother of warblers and uh, lovely lady. So there are some, uh, can there be more? Yes, there can be more. So we hope that our books will inspire people to, um, to become more involved. Uh, there's another woman called Miriam Murr. Miriam, who I know is a birdo. There's, there's several birdos, Carla. A question for you, Derek, will this presentation be posted on YouTube? Uh, yes, I think we, we agreed that it would, hey? Yeah, I'm happy for that. Um, and how could a Saudi photographer get in contact with me to share images? Um, I'm happy to share my, um, my uh, private email, um, chrisrjboland at gmail.com. And um, you can send emails to me, as long as they're nice. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think... Uh, that's the bottom. Sorry, go ahead. I think, I think we've made it to the end of the questions. Yes. Um, and I think uh, this has been a really, really, really interesting uh, presentation, Chris. And I think we definitely got to get you back again somehow or the other. Perhaps we need to get you back on, on uh, the bird is the word, as well as uh, uh, something on, um, on behavior. So let's, let's talk uh, and see what we can come up with during the rest I, of the year. I would love to. I, I, I... So impressed with the quality of presentations that people have been doing here, and the questions. I, it's, we've got an intelligent audience, and, I, and so I would love to present to an intelligent audience about the extraordinary endemic birds and their behaviour. Yeah, and we've got a growing audience from around the world. That was our goal when we started, and we're getting there. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. And hopefully uh, you will join us next week in Antarctica. Oh. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Chris. Masalama. Bye-bye. <laughs>